Hi, I'm Jake, and today we're going to talk about the Frontline Gaming's Las Vegas Team Tournament event. If you're new to the channel, what I do here is primarily cover competitive 40k content that I consider myself to be knowledgeable about, and I also produce fully painted battle reports at various competitive levels. And what I mean by competitive is not talking about the most beardy win at all cost aspect of things, but rather my interpretation of the most efficient and optimal approach to the game with the interest of winning more matches fair and square. If this kind of content interests you, you can stay up to date by staying subscribed. And if you ever have a suggestion on what kind of content you'd like for me to cover next, please drop me a line. So what was the Las Vegas team tournament or LVTT you might be asking? For those of you unfamiliar with the event, it was a team tournament ran by Frontline Gaming, which took place in Las Vegas the weekend of September 25th this year, 2021. What was super impressive was having 80 teams registered, meaning 400 players were planning to attend this event. Yes, 400 players. Unfortunately though, considering the current global climate, as you can imagine, there were some drops, but the event still managed to host nearly 300 players in total, 290 if I recall correctly. Each team consisted of five players and up to one non-playing coach, and each team member had to be a unique codex uh, from their teammates. And what that means is you can only have one Death Guard player, one Space Marines player, so on and so forth. What was really interesting to see was how pairings took place. Team captains rolled off to determine which defender on their side will select a table to play on first. Then both team captains secretly chose a defender list from their team and revealed them simultaneously. The same occurs for attackers right after. Furthermore, team captains picked one of the opposing attacker lists to face off against their defender. Uh, and this process was repeated until both teams were left with two unselected attacker lists who will then play one another on the final remaining table. On top of having to work with all of this, FLG events have been utilizing the somewhat controversial player optimized terrain, aka player placed terrain. So also factoring in which board setups each player was best suited for definitely had to be considered. On that note, I have to say, the more and more I interact with player place terrain, I am a huge fan of it. It may seem daunting at first on paper if you're reading up on it, but in practice, I feel it really balances the competitive mechanic just that much more, especially for melee armies. Continuing on, I thought it was insanely cool how some teams made actual playing cards to visually throw down their secret player picks, which added that extra layer of throwing down. Win losses were determined by which team won the most individual games and total cumulative battle points, which were the tiebreakers. Um, and that occurred a lot more than expected. But overall, pretty cool, right? I thought so too, especially since FLG decided to make pairings random rather than the usual score-based or battle points-based pairings. I was a huge fan of this uh, mechanic since submarining has been an unfortunate topic of conversation lately in the tournament circuits. So I thought it was really nice. Although I could tell that this messed with some players' heads who were tracking their own personal win-loss records, but in the grand scheme of things, the team mechanic called for strategic pairings, where some players just had to be thrown into losing matches for the greater good of the team. It's a team event. Okay, so where did I fit into all this? Well, I actually didn't play at this event like I wanted to, since my personal schedule has been way too shaky because of real life. Gross. So I didn't want to put myself in a position with some of the teams I could have competed with and potentially let them down by not being able to show up. However, closer to the event, my schedule happened to free up and coincidentally, I was asked by Frontline Gaming to participate as a judge. What an honor that was to be asked, so I jumped on the opportunity and committed to doing so. Up until then, I've never been a judge at a major event before, so I was pretty excited to see a tournament event from a completely different perspective, especially considering my partnership in an upcoming ITC major taking place in Las Vegas, November 2021, but that's going to be a whole separate announcement. I must say, judges are truly the unsung heroes at large events who carry the immense pressure of ruling fairly and accurately, uh, as well as trying to reference thousands and thousands of rules on the spot. That's hard. So if you do participate at any gaming tournament, try and appreciate your judges and understand that they're trying their best to be as fair as humanly possible. I'm 
a huge fan of frontline gaming events. Uh, from everyone I've attended to this year, not only are they gr a great crew personally, but you can tell that they try to host fun and fair as possible events, trying to take even player, pl uh, player feedback into careful consideration. And no, I don't work for them, nor do I get paid by them to say nice things. I just like to give credit where credit is due. Now let's go on to the event itself. There were a lot of big names in the tournament scene who came to compete at LVTT, such as Art of War, Tabletop Titans, Pro Tabletop, are names you're probably familiar with, uh, but there were also super solid teams with incredible skilled players running alongside all these big names. Again, it's hard to factor too much into individual player records throughout the event since captains paired up matches for the entire team to win the round rather than being a win by player by game by game. It was great to see a strong showing from Death Guard players, as usual, since most of you know that Nurgle owns my heart. But overall, it was a very, very mixed bag. Notably, there were a healthy amount of Grey Knights players as well, many of which were competing at their first big event since the Codex dropped, and they performed really well with high-scoring win points. Uh, notably, Charlie Andre of Frozen North Gaming scored the highest uh, in battle points with a 6-0 record overall, uh, followed by Leo, who some of you may recognize from this channel, ended up with an impressive 6-0 record. Well, technically 5-0 and 1 because of how draws were had to be treated on Best Coast pairings. Then followed closely by Nick Nonavanti from Art of War who went 5-1 personally, and his team ended up winning the entire event. So not too shabby. Again, not too far off from there were Brad Townsend and Evan Stump with also a 6-0 personal record. And to put it in perspective, out of the near 300 players, the top 30 included five Grey Knights players, which is mega impressive for a brand new codex. The strongest list definitely featured multiple Nemesis Dread Knights, which actually goes to show how hard they can actually hit. Secondly, and as expected, there were a lot of Orc players who showed up to harass the meta with Speedwog. I can relate because it's arguably one of the hardest matchups I've faced all year within the last two games that I've had to play against them, but regardless, they seem to do very well. With players like Eric Forsman going 6-0 and, oh, and Smite Club's Ben Jurek going 5-0-1, oh, also because of a draw. But we'll be covering some more in-depth analysis in a separate video on how the current meta has changed based on recent tournament play, such as this one. But in a nutshell, we saw a very strong showing overall from Grey Knights, Orcs, Admech, and of course Drukhari. It's very clear that these are the armies that you have to watch out for, especially when piloted by experienced and highly skilled players. It was definitely nice to see a bit of a shakeup from a few months back where all we saw pretty much was Admech dominating every event, <laughs> almost every event. And for all of you Death Guard players, because I know you're watching because this kind of started as a Death Guard content channel, I, I, I'm afraid the struggle is in fact, starting to get real. Uh, the more and more the meta shifts, it's getting very difficult. I will definitely be diving into that in great detail for an upcoming video about how and why Death Guard are struggling. And no, that is not why I am getting into Grey Knights and starting them ready for my next events. Uh, it's because I apparently have just a Dread Knight fetish. The biggest takeaway from all of this is how much I would definitely recommend participating in a properly ran team event because not only is it a lot of fun in general, but it's actually a great event for players newer to the competitive scene to participate in. I ran into several first timers at this event who had a lot of fun regardless of going up against some very, very tough matchups, but having your teammates next to you at an event can definitely soften any anxieties which you might be feeling otherwise, because that's real, tournament anxiety is real. But this goes to show how the diversity overall, which I think is very healthy for the Warhammer community as a whole. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in, and if you found this video to be helpful or informative by any measure and would like to see more content like this, please do say subscribe and join in on the conversation. I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.